Hello, Peppers. I am Chad Jolly from the TV show Planet America that was on air about three hours ago because I took a while to put this up because I was going to see comedy shows. Sorry about that. And you are? Dr. David Smith from the University of Sydney. Chaz, what's the comedy show that you went to see? Although you actually haven't been to see I haven't been to see it yet. yet. I'm about to see it. Okay. Uh, do you really want to know? I can tell you I'm seeing three tonight. Yeah. I'm seeing uh, Fady Kassab, Nikki Britton and Beck Melrose. And I'm Perfect. sure they were all fantastic. Yes. <laughs> um... You have nothing to apologise for. I'm the only one who has regrets. I have nothing to apologise so, for. <laughs> let's move on. Now, on today's show, on uh, the TV show, The Planet America, we, as you would expect, spoke a lot about Chauvin. Mm. And that was the big story. I'm kind of all talked out about that. I've got a few things to say, not much, but I imagine you have a few things to say. So why don't you kick us off on your thoughts on anything to do with mm -hmm. Chauvin or Floyd or this whole area? Well, I will... Start with the widely repeated observation that I think that this was absolutely the right outcome. It is worrying that it took that level of documentation of the crime, that level of video, plus the biggest wave of protest since the civil rights era, in fact, by some estimations, bigger than the civil rights era, in order to achieve this outcome. Not to mention cops turning on cops as well. Yes, yes. So, I mean, this was extraordinary for a number mm. of reasons. And, I mean, for the most basic reason that so few police killings ever go to trial. Mm. So, on average, more than 1,300 people are killed by police every year in the US. Now, a lot of those are clearly justifiable killings. Policing is a very dangerous job in such a heavily armed society. I actually did the numbers on the show today, so I might yes. as well just say the, the yep. exact numbers, that as as Dave said, I mean, gee, these numbers are just shooting killings, not yes. just all yeah, killings. Yeah, yeah. And shooting killings is about somewhere around 1,000 a, a year. Yes. For the last 15 years, going back to 2005, so that's 16 years actually, yep. there have been 140 police charged at all right. for any of those killings. Only half of them, Less than half of them were, were deemed justifiable homicides. Yeah. So that's about 7,000 that were in this grey zone. Mm. 140 went to court, seven murders, convictions. Yes. Now, yeah. I would recommend, by the way, if you're interested in why so many of these killings happen, I would recommend an article in Slate by Mary Harris called What Are Police Thinking? Which is an interview with an academic called Michael Sierra Aravalo, who's done a lot of field work with police, riding around with police, and he describes among police what he calls a culture of fear. And that is that in police training, there is this absolute emphasis on officer safety has to come first because you can't protect anyone else if you're dead yourself. So even though it's not usually explicitly stated, it's officer safety above public safety. Mm. Now, you can certainly see the reasoning behind that, except what he also talks about is in training, this bizarre emphasis on the most outlandish possible cases of danger. So he points to this example of the fact that some police, when they approach a car, they will routinely tap the trunk of the car. And this academic sort of witnessed this enough times that he asked this one officer, what is this all about? And he said, well, there could be a gunman inside the trunk of the car who could leap out and shoot you. And uh, this academic asked, well, have you ever heard of that happening before? He said, no. But there's this total emphasis on these absolute worst case scenarios. Well, to be fair, I did see a study. I think it was called Out of Sight with George Clooney where that happened. So, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and so you can imagine because, I mean, the point that he's making is even something like the George Floyd video or the video of the shooting of uh, Dante Wright, it looks very different from the point of view of a serving police officer who is just looking for every possible sign of danger anywhere. And he even points out that because police are basically so afraid of getting shot or attacked or subject to violence otherwise, he said they take these other insane risks with their safety, such mm. as driving at 85 miles an hour without a seatbelt in order to get away from sort of these other possible sources of danger. So A, policing is a very dangerous job in a heavily armed society. B, police training emphasises officer safety first and foremost and has this unusual emphasis on really outlandish possibilities of, uh, of violence. And all of this is a recipe for a large number of people dying at the hands of police, but also most of those killings being 
uh, yeah, never being close to mm. being uh, prosecuted or even sort of prosecutable. So highly unusual that it made it to court in the first place. Also, obviously, very, very unusual that the entire thing was live-streamed. Now, usually I don't like to talk at all about criminal cases because usually you never get to see the evidence that the jury gets to see, but everybody got to see it in in this case. And I think that's why, I mean, I remember on the morning in Australian time that it was announced after the jury had only been sequestered for 10 hours, basically everyone was saying, oh, yeah, this is going to be guilty Mm. because I think the combination of how little time it took the jury to deliberate comparatively combined with the fact that everybody had seen that footage, by that point everybody was confident that that would uh, actually be the result. And as you say, the other incredibly unusual thing was police, including the police chief of Minnesota, actually testifying against Chauvin. So this was absolutely the right result. But, yeah, what it took to get to this point is really disheartening um, in in many ways. Now, there are a couple of other peripheral issues I want to mention. Firstly, I don't think that it was right for Joe Biden to say, uh, you know, I'm praying for the right verdict, mm. given that it was very obvious what he thought the right mm. verdict was. Um, I mean, I know that the jury was sequestered, so there wasn't any chance of it influencing that, but I, I just think that was wrong from the point of view of the impartiality of the law. On the other hand, I mean, he was saying just what a lot of people were thinking yes. um, at, at that point. And Joe Biden has never been one to keep his mouth shut at the, <laughs> at the right moment. Let's, uh, yeah, let, let's be honest about this. At least he held on, unlike Maxine Waters. That's true. Yes. <laughs> yes. He waited till the jury weren't there to be influenced. Yes. yes. Yeah. So, um, yes, I, I just uh, did want to mention that, but I don't mm. think that that's a... That's a huge black mark against Biden. Someone did point out, I can't remember who, that uh, you know, if Obama had said something like that, he would never, ever hear the end of it. Yeah, Like, this is going to be a non-issue for, for Biden. He'll just be able to, you know, but, b- Biden his way through it. But yeah. if, if Obama had done that, you, we would actually never hear the end of the That's issue. That's absolutely true. But we should just point out, I mean, I don't need to point this out. It's obvious. Yes. But Trump did exactly that with Paul Manafort. Absolutely, yes. And it, it was just... Controversy of the day, move on. Yes. And I learned today that Richard Nixon weighed in on the trial of Charles Manson. I don't know what it was he said, but that certainly would have been an interesting little cultural moment. Um, Anyway, I said a couple of peripheral points. I think that was actually the only one that I can remember at the moment. By the way, let me know afterwards the Slate article. I'll put it in the homework that you yes. guys can read that it's in the It's really, blurb. really worth yeah. worth reading. Okay, so just look up in the blurb just above this on the Facebook or on the YouTube video. Yes, and thanks very much to Steve Massive for alerting me to that one. Yeah. Uh, the only peripheral thing that I didn't mention in the um, on the show, which I think is worth mentioning about this particular aspect of the topic yes. uh, of race, is... The Tucker Carlson stuff was very oh funny. Yes, it was yeah, very okay. funny. Yeah, Basically, yeah. For, for those, a lot of people have seen the end, but it's mm. not just the end. <laughs> okay, the, essentially, what happened was uh, Tucker Carlson clearly, unlike a lot of people on Fox News, mm. had made up his mind to support Chauvin. Yes, whatever happened, but he didn't want to say it. He no. didn't want to say it because he didn't have the balls to say it. So, <laughs> so he just kept on implying it and just generally acting like a sourpuss on the yes. day the verdict came yeah, out. Yeah. Like uh, all he said was the jurors in the Derek, Derek Chauvin trial came to a unanimous and unequivocal verdict this afternoon. Please don't hurt us. And he acted as if it was just they were intimidated by the threat of, I don't know, Maxine Waters' people <laughs> or something for her army. Um, look, obviously, if they'd been not guilty all the way, there probably would have been a riot. But the yeah. suggestion that that was preeminent amongst the jurors' consideration, I think is very disrespectful to the jurors. It's highly disrespectful to the There's no evidence jurors. whatsoever that that is the case. No. That's just Tucker Carlson mind reading. Mm. Um, but anyway, but on this day that he was not very happy, mm. they booked a guest. My theory, not just my theory, I've seen a few people on the internet say this, <laughs> that, <laughs> but our theory <laughs> yeah, yes. is that someone in his office made a mistake. Oh. Because they booked someone from the... New York City Sheriff's Department. Right. And I think 
they thought that's kind of the same as the NYPD. It is not the same as the <laughs> NYPD, people. But they're very different views, yes. very different positions. This, so this guy was like a normal police officer, mm. <laughs> giving normal police officer responses. He wasn't macho. He wasn't all heightened and ready to go. This guy's Ed Gavin. And Tucker Carlson clearly had enough of this guy very <laughs> rapidly. You could see the tone that he was looking for in this interview from the yes. way it started. Forget the, big, the end for now. Mm. Just look at how it started. <laughs> Ed Gavin is a former deputy sheriff with the New York City Sheriff's Department. He joins us with his perspective on what this means for law enforcement. Ed Gavin, thanks so much for coming on tonight. Who's going to become a cop going forward, do you think? Well, I think um, people will still become uh, police officers. Um, it's, um, it, this really is a learning experience for everyone. Um, let's face it. What, what we saw uh, in that video was pure savagery. Okay, great question, Tucker. Who's going to be a cop after this? I would have thought the same people who would be doctors after Kermit Gosnell went to jail for murdering fetuses. Oh, that's a great comeback. <laughs> that's, you know, that's excellent. You, you don't need to you don't need to kill people to be a cop, all right? But anyway, um, but, uh, uh, now, apart from the amusement that this guy clearly hasn't been on TV before, <laughs> the way his <laughs> yes. eyes are darting around everywhere, Tucker Carlson comes in with that stupid first question. And this guy just immediately goes into saying what Chauvin did was wrong. Yes. He then answers at length about why what he did was wrong. And this is Tucker Carlson's big follow-up mm. to, to the first question. It was, it was an open and shut case. But moving forward, what we need to do in my opinion, as we we need to have. How about enforce the uh, law? Okay, do we need to do that? So uh, hold on, wait. So wait, slow down. Do we do we enforce the law? Like, let's say people are going through the windows in Macy's and the cops are just standing there. Do they resign no, no. because we all, we obviously their honor is being no. violated, but they're not doing anything about it? When do they start doing something about it and protecting everyone else, not just George Floyd? No, no. What I, I want I want people to protect. I want the police to protect people, but. When specifically what we're dealing here, we're dealing with a person in custody who was handcuffed and he was subdued. So the big follow up is, well, if if you can't strangle people, yeah, then how can you possibly enforce the law? How can you stop looting happening? That's the only way you can stop looters by yeah. by kneeling on their neck for nine minutes at a time. And this guy reasonably says, hang on, hang on. I'm not saying don't don't mm. enforce the law. I'm just saying. When this person is subdued, <laughs> you need to... And he goes on to say... This, a, this yeah. must have been so fucking weird for Fox News viewers <laughs> to see. <laughs> like, what? It was very funny. And, and, and um, it felt like it lasted forever, but actually his whole thing lasted for three minutes. Because after three minutes, Tucker Carlson just said, I've had enough of this reasonable person oh, on the air. Oh, dear. And this is how it ended, which is a lot of people have seen the ending. It's just delightful. Just how furious and ineffectual Tucker Carlson yeah. is at the same time. I, I just think that it was excessive yeah, and, and well, it shouldn't happen. And what I'd like the, to see... The guy who did it looks like he's going to spend thing... the rest of his life in prison. So I'm kind of more worried about the rest of the country, which thanks to police inaction, in case you haven't noticed, is like boarded up. <laughs> so... That's more my concern, but, but I appreciate let, you let, coming let, on. Let, Ed Gavin, thank let, you. Let, let. Nope, done. Thank you. Heather McDonald is the author. How furious is he? How angry is he that he had someone reasonable on? And the thing is, <laughs> the, the great thing about that is no matter how much power and influence Tucker Carlson is now, no matter how much he's been able to rehabilitate his career, to me, he always is just that bow tie wearing George W. Bush supporting <laughs> wanker on Crossfire. Like, that's yeah. all he ever he is that mm. incredibly little man who was just there for entertainment value and whose career got ended by Jon Stewart telling CNN that this was all a bunch of bullshit. Like, that's that's always what he's going to be, no matter how much he becomes, you know, the Trump whisperer or whatever. It's funny that you use the word little to describe him because yeah. I couldn't help noticing that. Like, you know, if you think of the prairie, if you think yes. of the savannah yeah, yeah, yeah. of cable news hosts yes. out there, yeah, you know, there's the lions that roar, you know, that was, I guess, O'Reilly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like the, now, Tucker Carlson, he acts like the hyena. When he gets vicious, he, he laughs. That little, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. That's like a hyena little snark. Like if a prior, if a yeah, <laughs> if a hyena went to prep school, <laughs> was the heir to a frozen food fortune. Anyway, I found it very funny. Yeah. Um, and just as a little side to my aside, um, the, yes. I did read a, a complete unrelated article, which was interesting. That yeah. a lot of people are trying to boycott Tucker Carlson, like get ad boycotts, and right? Stuff. Yes, yes. Just making the point that. Yeah. 
uh, Fox generates only 30% of its revenue from ads. Mm. The rest is from cable subscriptions, yes. right? Yes, yes. And so ad boycotts aren't going to do it for your highest rating host. No. Because he's going, because, yeah, he is one of the reasons people subscribe, presumably. Yes, yeah. Right? The, and the, the, the article I read had an interesting proposal, which was that you know, if you really want to get Fox, mm. and, yeah, this won't happen tomorrow, yeah. but, yeah, down the track. Yes, yeah. If you really want to get Fo- if you really wanted to convince Fox to not have Tucker Carlson, Ad boycotts aren't the thing. The thing to do is for Major League Baseball or Mm. for the NFL to say, you know what? We're not going to sell you our our rights anymore, Fox. Ah. Because Fox Sports is the reason why Fox News exists. Absolutely, yes. Because they, they, they have no choice but to run Fox News cable providers. Yes, if they want to run Fox Sports. Absolutely. And Fox Sports relies on the big leagues, on Major League Baseball, yes. on F- NFL, etc. Yeah. So that is actually their point of vulnerability. It's not mm. ads, ads, it's the sports leagues. Yeah. And the and like and yeah, given what we've uh, seen in the last couple of w- weeks, I mean, it'll take some imagination to see this happening, but you know, if, yeah, if they went way too far, that would be the point of vulnerability. Yes. But anyway, not for yeah, <laughs> I don't I don't see no. that. Happening. No, I know. I mean, especially not NFL owners. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Anyway, um, on this area, there were obviously there's all kinds of stuff happening in the last few weeks yes, in, yeah. in this area. I just want to. I actually want to spend more time on the other stuff because we didn't talk about the other stuff on the show. Yes. First of all, the Makia uh, Makia, I think it's how you say it, Makia Bryant shooting, mm-hmm. which happened at basically the same time as the verdict came down. Yes. Um, now, when it first came out, uh, it was. It was passed on as another potential police brutality case, except mm-hmm. this time it's a 16-year-old girl. Yep. Uh, people are going, oh, here we go. This is a bit of a problem. Uh, there's a lot of, all of a sudden, a lot of tweets about how she was a happy, fun-loving girl and mm. all the rest. And you can see where this is going. Then the footage comes out. The police rush out the footage as soon as they can. Uh, it's a body camera, which clearly shows that she's holding a knife mm. uh, and that she was in, not in the act of stabbing someone, but about to stab someone when, he, when she was when she was shot. At least apparently about to stab someone because mm. that's a point I'm about to make. Uh, and then uh, the side on, and then we saw yeah, like a still of it. And then mm. the side on shot came out, which I will show you now because not a lot of people have seen this one. <laughs> so what that that what that adds that adds first of all the audio. So you can hear what they're saying to each other. The second thing that adds is that you can see from side on that that the that that Bryant is literally has her hand in the air with the knife at the moment she is shot. Mm. You couldn't really tell that on the body cam footage, but on the side on it's very clear that her hand is up in the air at the back of the swing uh, with the knife in the air at the moment being being stopped. And you can hear her yelling out, "I'm a stab the fuck out of you, bitch!" A couple of seconds before that. Um, now. The first thing I want to point out is she may not have done so. Mm. There's a lot of people at the moment saying, well, the cop had a choice. Which life? Mm. Yeah, like it, 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 doesn't the black life mean something to the person mm. who she was about to stab? Well, she might not have stabbed her mm. because she was not moving her hand in at the point she was shot. Her hand was up. Mm. She might have just been threatening her. She might have just been, been blustering. It's hard to know. Um, I'm, not, I'm not being playing defense lawyer here. I'm just saying... Let, I was going to say. <laughs> no, just, just going to be clear about these things. This is, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, Sometimes I wonder if you missed your true calling. <laughs> Secondly, had she, this is going to sound even more defence lawyer Yes. Had she actually stabbed her, there's no there's no saying that she nef- necessarily, the, the, the victim would have died. Right. It could have just stabbed her in her shoulder. Mm. It could have been you know, a superficial wound. Yes. Right. The reason why I'm saying this kind of stuff mm. is that, Number one, there is no doubt, in yeah, my yeah. view, that the police officer was confronted with a genuine threat of some kind. Mm-hmm. Okay, that, yeah, is, yeah. that is a fact, I think. Mm. Um, but in any other country in the world, yes, that person wouldn't have necessarily been shot as mm. a result That's of that. That's true, If yes. this was England, yes, they wouldn't yeah, have yeah. been shot, yeah. right? Um, and so what happens in those other countries, right? Because I think that I think that's an important question because what mm. happened now, I'll come back to this in a second. Yes. What happened now was the responses became weird. Mm. When, the, when the actual footage came out, and this might be just be on Twitter, people not backing down, but yeah. there were some weird responses. Where, like Valerie Jarrett, who's an important person. She's you know, the head of the Obama's Foundation. Yes. She's, she's got links to the Biden administration. Yes, yeah. Yeah, she tweets out, a black teenage girl named Makia Bryant was killed because a police officer immediately decided to shoot her multiple times in order to break up a knife fight. 
demand accountability, fight for justice, Black Lives Matter. So she knew what happened mm. and she was still gunning yeah. for, the, for the police officers, so to speak. Rashid Tlaib, Nakia's TikTok videos show her childhood and joy. Her smile at the end of the videos just breaks me a little more. It's been maddening to see so many people strip away the fact that a child was killed. We cannot be a society that justifies the killing of a child. And so on. And then you start getting people actually saying, you yeah, know, knife fights aren't a big deal. Kids have been knife fighting for years. You know, mm. Joy Reid is saying, I remember someone with a pen knife in a fight and the police and the teacher broke them up without a gun, etc." And then starting to minimise the fact that knife fights could be... So you're going in a weird direction there. Mm. Um, and that annoyed me because... There's no need to make, I know Twitter does, but there's no need to make someone 100% innocent and 100% guilty. You can have a situation where you say the girl is dangerous, the cop was following his training, mm. but that's still not what should have happened. And that, that's kind of where I am, I feel. Like I feel, right. like I feel like I don't want the cop to be punished. He was doing what he was told to do. And mm. I don't think there's any racism involved there. I don't think so. But at the same time, I don't think we should have a situation where in America, this is so often the case, where... All threats must be neutralized by shooting us. Yes, yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, there must be another way possible. Yeah, and I mean, uh, this comes back to the issue of the training. Mm. So, as far as I could see, one of the key points in the Chauvin trial was these police saying he didn't follow his training. Mm. And one of the things that the defence was trying to argue was, no, he was trained a long time ago. Uh, you know, Chauvin's 45 years old. Mm. And actually, that, that was compatible with the training that he received at the time. They're saying, yeah, maybe that training wasn't great, but he actually was acting within his training. So, And, you know, the prosecution was so eager to say, the police are not on trial here. Derek Chauvin mm -hmm. is on trial. So one of the many issues that this trial actually avoided was this issue of police training mm. itself. And, yeah, whether that police training, which, as we've already talked about mm. today, often kind of emphasises... Uh, yeah, violent threats at the expense of everything else, whether that is actually appropriate. Yeah, and the people doing the training as well. Yes, I mean, yeah. Chauvin was a trainer. Yeah. Potter, the the woman who m mistook a gun for a taser, yes, yeah. she was that very day going to train someone. Yes. That yeah. was what her schedule was. Yes, yeah. Uh, and you know, I remember reading an article, I don't even remember where it was, I'm sorry, mm. where out of the, the 10 biggest uh, police departments, Half of them had no problems with people conducting training who had been uh, accused of brutality. Yeah, and you go, well, those people shouldn't be doing training. Yes. <laughs> there must be there must be enough police out there who haven't been accused of brutality who yeah. can do training. You know, it's um, it, it's a problem. I think. It I think it's a real, real it's problem. a real problem. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, do you have anything else to say about the Bryant one? Uh, no. No. Okay. The other uh, the other one that's floating around. I want to clear up a couple of things on is the right. Yes. Uh, shooting the Duante Wright. Yes. That's the Potter, the woman who mistook the taser for the mm. for the um, uh, gun. I saw Pat Robertson had some thoughts on that. Yeah, he he found it hard to believe. Yeah, yeah. Pat Robertson is. It's weird what's happened to him in the last few years. Yes. I, yeah. I don't think anything's happened to him. I think he's stayed the same. I just think the right have moved right. Yes, with Pat Robertson. Yeah. Um, <laughs> amazingly, um, well, the first thing before we before we get to the a few details, I just wanted to clear up the warrant issue with that because a lot of people say a lot of different things about that warrant about what he was, what what the warrant was for his arrest right. about. Some of the things are just flat out wrong, but mm -hmm. there is actually understandable confusion. I wanna, and so I want to clear up because I don't think many people have. Correct us. Um, first of all, okay, this is the whole story. Everything I'm about to say is alleged, okay? Don't make me say alleged 50,000 50, mm -hmm. times. <laughs> all right, so, okay, assume alleged. He and uh, Duante Wright and a high school friend back in 2019 slept over a woman's house after a party, okay? Mm -hmm. Next day, he sees the woman put $820 into her bra for rent. He, I'll read, I'll read the quote from the court record. Defendant Wright placed his hand around victim's neck and choked her while trying to pull the cash out from under her bra. Defendant Wright then told her that he would shoot her and said, give me the money and we will go. Defendant Wright then tried to choke victim a second time and tried to take her money. Somehow she got away. I don't know how. She identified him. They issued a warrant for his arrest. He was immediately arrested. Okay. He posted bond under certain conditions. Mm -hmm. Then the following summer, so we're talking in 2020 now, uh, police got a call about a guy waving a gun around and that violated, it was right, mm -hmm. and that violated his conditions. Okay. So they then tried to arrest him. He runs away. He then no longer turns up for parole as well, he, or not parole, yeah, like with his bond, mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 his supervisor. So he's then detained again, mm -hmm. and then he's released on bond again 
in September 2020, okay? Then he has a court appearance on April 2. He doesn't show for, for that, mm. for all that stuff, okay? And that was why the warrant was out for his arrest right. at this time. Okay, so, okay. so those who say it was for guns charges, mm -hmm. that's true. Yes. Those who say, no, it was for a robbery, that's also true. Right. It, was, it, was a, it was a chain of events. Okay. What isn't true is what the, in my view, the worst journalist in Washington, Yamish Yalkandur said. I could go on about her forever. From P I don't know how she's working for PBS. She makes so many mistakes. Oh, I wasn't aware of this oh. animus. Oh, I, I really don't like her. Anyway, uh, I, one day I'll go through in detail. I'll, I'll give you literally 10 reasons I don't like her. She's, she's made so many mistakes over the past. She's, she's very, very partisan. And unlike someone like Jim Acosta, who's partisan, but cares about accuracy. Mm. She's partisan and doesn't care about accuracy. And what, this is a great example. Let me read a quote for you from her on MSNBC. You can imagine, of course, the, there's some who say, why run for the police, why, from the police? Why try to get away from them? But there are people who, who are simply terrified of the police for good reason in some ways. So the mother and fa family of Duante Wright today said, can you imagine what Dante was probably feeling as he had three officers surrounding him for what seemed like a minor infraction having to do with a warrant for marijuana, a business that people make money with all over the country? So I think there really needs to be a big conversation about that. Okay, now. Nowhere were people saying it was marijuana, except for on the internet. She got that from an internet rumor. All right, so the so journalists should not be running with internet rumors, in my view. They should be doing fact checking. Only podcasters. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Anyway, um, but uh, uh, so anyway, I just want to clear up the warrant thing because there's a lot of confusion out there. So that, that's that. Okay, second thing. Okay. All right. I wasn't aware of any of that. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. I like to do that. Uh, Pelosi was, was copying some grief for saying that it was just a guns charge. Right. But she's, she was right what she was saying. It's just there's, there's a whole story to understand. Okay. Um, now, I'm actually more interested, though, in the police because the case against Potter, mm. the officer, it yes. might be a tough case, to be mm. honest. You can expect her to get off, and I'll tell you why. Right. And that's not going to be pretty when, when, no. when I think she, she will. Mm. Two things. First of all, there's a legal concept out there that's been used a number of times now successfully mm -hmm. called slips and capture. And it's uh, when the uh, um, when muscle memory under stress makes you turn to what you normally do. So you know how we, we've probably heard, and you've probably heard, a lot of people have heard about how they've got their guns and their tasers on different sides of their body. Yes. The gun they always use, the taser mm. they almost never use. Yes. So the, the theory of slips and captures, sometimes when you panic mm. under stress, you just go for what you're used to. That's your muscle memory. Right. And so even though she, was, she wanted to go for her taser, she actually went for yeah, her yeah. gun. That's the theory. Mm. Now, whether it's true or not, people have used it in court before. Yes. Let's just say they don't use that or it doesn't work. Mm. Second thing, this is a second degree manslaughter statute that's, re that's relevant to this. Mm -hmm. A person who causes the death of another by any of the following means is guilty of manslaughter in the second degree. One, by the person's culpable negligence whereby the person creates an unreasonable risk and consciously takes chances of causing death or great bodily harm to another. Mm. So if the court, assuming the court buys the she made a mistake thing, mm -hmm. The word consciously is a real problem. Right. And the New York Times was quoting a professor of criminal law about precisely this, mm. saying she thinks she's firing a taser. How can we prove beyond a reasonable doubt that she consciously took chances of at least causing great bodily harm? Mm. Now, there were those who say she shouldn't have fired the taser at the chest anyway. Mm -hmm. You're not supposed to do that. So maybe they could get through that. But I'm just worried about that word. Mm. So I just want to flag that. Okay. Um, a... We've already talked about the training issue with her, that she was actually a trainer, which is concerning. <laughs> and, and, uh, um, uh, no, I don't have anything else to say about that. I just want to clear up a few things like that. Mm. Um, any, anything else about the race issue? Oh, yeah. Oh, Tom Cotton. <laughs> oh, I, I'm not aware of this. <laughs> this, is, this is this is just a little aside, but it's just uh, – yes. you won't be aware of this. This is not well known. Yeah, but yeah. Tom Cotton, April 7. Right. Just before all these cases happened. Yes. We have, this is him on Twitter, we have a major under-incarceration problem in America oh and God. it's only getting worse, Tom Cotton. I, I, I know I've got to the point now where I just say, oh, Tom Cotton. I don't explain anymore what I'm talking about, but I feel like the people who've been with us the whole journey don't need anything else no. other than Tom Cotton. No. <laughs> I do have one more thing. It's a stats nugget. Stats, stats nugget. nugget. Stats nugget. 
And it's also what's becoming a weekly segment where I quote Kevin Drum. Okay. okay. <laughs> He's very good. We should get a Kevin Drum sting. Save your time and just read Kevin Drum's uh, blog. This is an interesting one. The Bureau of just, Justice Statistics yes. There's a survey. So, yeah, it might not be 100% accurate, but yeah, mm-hmm. whatever. It's yes, a lot yeah. of people. 11.7% of white people and 11% of black people have had, this is in 2018, mm-hmm. had police initiated contact in that year. Wow. Okay, so the police approached them. 11.7% of white people, 11% of black people. Hispanics, 9.8%. Mm-hmm. It suggests that police were approaching white and black people in proportionate amounts. Right. No racism there. Right? Mm-hmm. But. But. <laughs> only 2% of white people had experienced force by the police. Ah, uh, yes. Compared to 4.8% of Hispanics and 5.3% of black people. Yes. So that's interesting. And wait for it. 0.1% of whites had had a police gun drawn on them compared to 0.8% of black people. Right. Okay. So now I, I can already hear the the... Uh, some people saying, oh, hang on, but the, 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 the black people they came into contact with may have been committing more crimes. And yeah, well, maybe so. I'm just mm. putting out there that they approached white and black people the same amount. Yes. But they approached the black person with force. Right. Three to- or two yes. and a half times yeah, as much. Yeah. And they approached them with a gun eight times as much. Yes. So just. Yeah. Because police yeah. approaches can be all kinds of mm. things. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, just yeah, showing yeah. that out there. I thought that was an interesting statistic. That is. I just want to say one more thing yes, about uh, all of this, yeah. which is that I think that Keith Ellison is an outstanding official. So Keith Ellison is the Attorney General of Minnesota, first African-American uh, to hold statewide elected office in Minnesota, which is a state that for most of its history has been very white, but is increasingly, largely because of immigration, uh, has an increasing uh, increasing population of Somalis and, uh, and various other African-descended people within the state. Race issues in Minnesota, they're not completely different from the rest of the country, but there are some quite sort of uh, distinctive things about, uh, yeah, about Minnesota. And it takes a lot of um, takes a lot of skill to negotiate mm. those issues, which I think that Keith Ellison uh, has been doing very well. And a lot of people doubted him as well. Yeah. Now mm. Keith Ellison, he was the first Muslim elected to Congress mm. uh, in the United States back in two thousand and six. He was sworn in on the Quran that mm. uh, that belonged to Thomas Jefferson. Um, I always thought that the Democrats made a mistake going with Tom Perez rather than Keith Ellison mm. as uh, as national chair of the uh, of the Democratic Party. I think he's it was an extraordinary political talent. Uh, he left the House of Representatives in 2018 or uh, to to concentrate on his run at Minnesota Attorney General, and I think his 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 talents are very well used there. I'm not sure of the exact timing of these things, but yeah. it's possible that mm. the Democrats passed him over because of the domestic violence allegations. Which I think had I think occurred just before they passed him over. Maybe it might have right. been just after. Mm. But depending on how the timing goes, like they when he ran for attorney general, that was a big issue, the domestic violence allegations. But um uh yeah, but maybe that was a Democrat thing, I don't know. Mm. But anyway, whatever. He was he did he's done very well in this case, there's yes, no he doubt has. about that. Yeah. Um and also he's the only person that picked picked Trump back in April twenty fifteen. Sure he did. <laughs> so he picked him real early. Yep. Um Oh, the only thing I'd say, I don't want to go into detail on this. The only reason I'm kind of bringing up is just how funny the the coder is, which is there's a bit of a beat up at the moment about the one of the co-founders of BLM, Patrice Kalors. She's bought a lot mm. of expensive property. Yeah. Like she bought some property in the Bahamas and like four million bucks worth of property, I think it was off the top of my head. Uh, $1.4 million property in this real white area. And, and all, the, all the conservatives are saying, I thought you liked black people. It's like, yeah, she... She doesn't want them to get killed. Yeah. <laughs> it's not that she wants to be surrounded by them at all times. She just doesn't want black people to get killed. That's her thing. Anyway, but um, uh, there's been a lot of allegation, been a lot of insinuation. No one comes out and explicitly says yes, it. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of insinuation that basically you give money to Black Lives Matter, you give money to her properties. Essentially, that's insinuation. Right. I just want to just, first of all, BLM, they put out a statement about this. 
which I think is worth reading. Mm. Patrice Collor serves in this role in a volunteer capacity and does not receive a salary or benefits. Patrice has received a total of $120,000 since the organization's inception in 2013. For duties such as serving as spokesperson and engaging in political education work, she did not receive any compensation after 2019. To be abundantly clear, BLM cannot and did not commit any organizational resources towards the purchase of personal property by any employee or volunteer. Any insinuation to the contrary is categorically false. Okay, so they completely deny that. And also, she's written a book. She's signed a multi-year deal with Warner Brothers. Yeah. She's she's well paid, you know, yes. outside BLM. Yes. So so that's not a big surprise mm -hmm. that she can afford property. But, but like I said, there is a funny coda, which is while personally – I'm not too wow. I don't really care about people using their, their private money for whatever they mm -hmm. like. That's fine. She's allowed, to, even if she's a socialist, she's allowed to buy property, right? The, the uh, um, you can you can want society to work towards something, yes, and not insist on having it happen to you personally now. That's right. That's yes. like saying, oh, environmentalists shouldn't drive cars, you know, like, yes. like, like etc. Yeah, you know, oh, Al Gore, he should he should have a small house, you know, like, as far as I, as far as I'm concerned, you can work towards something, mm. right? But her reaction was hilariously bad. <laughs> this is this is her quote. The way that I live my life is in direct support of black people, including my black family members, first and foremost. And so for many black folks who are able to invest in themselves and their community, they choose to invest in their family. And that's what I've chosen to do. I have a child. I have a brother that has severe mental illness who I take care of. I support my mother. I support many other family members of mine. So I see my money is not my own. I see it as my family's money as well. So that to me is a is is a very very unconvincing reason for why why she's not a hypocrite on on socialism. What she should have said is none of your business. I can spend my money wherever I like. But the but the uh, but just the idea of no, I'm helping the community by helping my family. I feel like a lot of rich people could say exactly the same thing. Yeah, I don't know. Am I being unfair? <laughs> I thought that was lame. But even well, though I'm I, just surprised you've thought about it yeah. this much well, to be honest dave, this is another thing i was just not even aware of dave i think about everything Patrice colors buying <laughs> real estate you should know by now i think about everything mate now tell, you, you're talking to me about what i've thought about yes yeah because now we're getting to what you've thought about oh yes this is exciting this yes. is exciting for the peppers the peppers are going to love this sit down and i don't normally give you the the, the hurry up here uh, mm. but but sit down folks yes Put on some comfy headphones yes. and get ready for the first ever PEP exclusive investigation. That's right. <laughs> Dr. Dave, take it away. The investigation <laughs> into the subject, are Americans ruining world sports? Oh, tell me, Dave. Dr. Dave <laughs> investigates. <laughs> do, 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 do. To be honest, this isn't an investigation. This is something that I've thought about for about five minutes. But Although, actually, one way or another, I have been thinking about this for... 15 years. Okay. So wow. ever since I this first went to the University of Michigan. This will be good. Okay. So <laughs> the the what prompts this is actually something that happened outside of the US. Like Super League? This week. Yes. The, the, <laughs> the biggest news in the world, apart from Derek Chauvin and India getting <laughs> overrun by COVID, was yeah. the English Super League. Now, mm. I don't think I've ever seen a proposal that was so unpopular involving mm. something that popular. Like there's, it's not just that there are no sports bigger than European football. There are a few things bigger than European football in terms of the number of people who are really into it. Now, for those of you not familiar with this saga, the first thing to note is that European football has this unique and much loved pyramid structure. So in every domestic league, There'll, there'll be hundreds of teams in any country organised in this club structure and there'll be a top flight league that they're all aspiring to get into but they have to go through this promotion, this process of promotion where they have to come in the top three in a league below and they work up their way up through the leagues and of course the flip side of that is relegation. Mm. Anyone can get relegated uh, from the league that they're in usually if they come in the bottom three. Which is a great innovation. It is. It's fantastic. Yeah. It always means that there's excitement at both ends of the competition. And at the very top flights, um, what makes those really exciting? Because often, to be honest, in those leagues, the, the winner is clear by you know months out yeah. who's going to win. But because there are four spots available in the Champions League in, say, the English Premier League, that makes it really exciting uh, further down the, uh, the competition. And that 
to be frank, is necessary in a sport where not every individual game is exciting. Even enthusiasts of European football will ignore you know, not every game's exciting, but there's this meaning to it because of this pyramidal structure. Now, it is true that in most leagues, it's a handful of teams that dominate. So um, what happened was that 12 of these teams across the three biggest leagues, so the English, the Spanish, and uh, the Italian leagues, decided, well, they I don't know how long they'd been working on this, but they announced a breakaway league of only these top, most elite teams. So this is in uh, Serie A in, uh, in Italy. This was AC Milan, Inter Milan, and Juventus. In La Liga in Spain, this was Barcelona, Real Madrid, and Atletico Madrid. And in the English Premier League, this was Manchester United, Manchester City, Liverpool, Tottenham Hotspur, Chelsea, and Arsenal. So basically between them, the teams that have won nearly every championship in those leagues for the last couple of decades, with with a few exceptions like Leicester City wasn't in there. So I... I... Uh, this might be a very ignorant question, but yeah. how many teams are in the Champions League? So the Champions League has, under the new structure that they've just approved, 36 teams. Okay, all right. So is, is it substantially smaller than this Super League? No, the Super League only would have been 12. I know, so I'm saying substantially yeah, you, smaller. Yes. Because yeah, yeah. if the Champions League was like 18 teams, you go, what's the difference? It's yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, it's 36, okay. which I think yeah. is up from, I think up from 34. Okay. I'm, I'm sure we've got uh, a lot of... English football, okay. European football fans who sure. can uh, who can correct me. Mm. By the way, I'm assiduously not using the term soccer because that just pisses so many people off. But <laughs> I do want to point out that the term soccer is as old as the term football. It comes from association football, sock. So it's actually not an incorrect, but, you know, I, I realise people get very sensitive about this. That's so, why an associate professor. Yes, so <laughs> that's right. I'm a <laughs> soccer professor. So... Um, yeah, so they're going to form this breakaway league, and the rea- and I think that they would have the the idea was they wanted three more teams to join as foundational members. They were after the two biggest uh, German clubs, who were Bayern Munich and the other one that is just escaping me, sorry, um, and Paris Saint Germain as well. And the idea was that there'd be these fifteen foundational clubs that could not be relegated, and then they would uh, five more would compete. Uh, every year mm. to to get in. So kind of like a scaled down version of Champions League mm. except with the same teams year after year. Now, this just struck nearly everyone as a terrible, terrible idea. Yeah, it just sounds like a, just a worse version of Champions League. Yeah, because yeah. I mean, I think that everyone realises and you know, Real Madrid's um, owner said, well, no one cares about the Champions League until the quarterfinals. But I think everybody realises that, okay, yes, it's a very special fixture, say, when Manchester City plays Manchester United. It's going to get a lot less special if it's on every fucking week. Mm. Right. So it was real, and there were a lot of things to dislike about this. The fact that it was backed by venture capital, right? So it was basically going to get off the ground with a $3.5 billion infrastructure grant that uh, JP Morgan had raised It's the fact that it's not just the most successful clubs, but it was all the richest clubs. But in many cases, clubs that are running aground on their own financial mismanagement. Mm. Okay, So they can blame COVID all they like for their financial (laughs) problems. But the the fact is that they're just very badly managed in the first place. Um, But just it, it struck so many people as this will actually just ruin European football. Because if it degrades the status of the Champions League, as it would have done that would mean that a lot of the drama is taken out of the domestic leagues. Mm. and But people also just found it absolutely morally offensive that these clubs could have a competition from which they could not be relegated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Gary Neville, a uh, former Manchester United player, was just absolutely savage on Manchester United and Liverpool for this. Uh, like, how dare you call yourself clubs of the people or the workers? But, yeah. So, theoretically... If the fifteen, uh, I'm losing track of the numbers here. But if yeah. if the if the original foundational clubs, yes, all came last, like yeah, like yeah, yeah. If, if, and the five other ones, yeah, came came 
top five yes. for whatever reason. Yeah, yeah. Someone would get relegated who came fifth or fourth or third. Yep, that's right. <laughs> Which makes no sense whatsoever. No, no, this was not very <laughs> well thought out. Okay, yeah. how does this relate to the US, given that this is an American-themed podcast? Yes, please. <laughs> okay, so the first thing is that a lot of the owners who were involved are American. So mm. there was John Henry from Liverpool. Mm. John Henry took over Liverpool in, I think, 2010 from two even worse American owners. Mm. Uh, and that, that was Tom Hicks and I think Bob Gillette, uh, who were a couple of uh, <laughs> agribusiness meat magnates okay. <laughs> who uh, had an interest in sports as well. Tom Hicks owned a few Texas-based teams. Anyway, <laughs> they went bankrupt, uh, which did not impress the Liverpool fans at all. There was a great slogan at the time about Liverpool Shanks built it Yanks broke it <laughs> um, yeah so that, that that was that was also not that long before that I think it was in 2005 the Glazer family who owned the Tampa Bay Buccaneers okay. had bought Manchester United so fresh <laughs> off the success of winning the Super Bowl in 2003 the Glazers buy this beloved club and Manchester United fans are like what the fuck I mean some of them are NFL fans but no, nobody's a fan of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers <laughs> uh, so yeah the Glazers you had John Henry uh, Stan Kroenke who owns the now Los Angeles Rams. He moved them away from St. Louis. Mm. So, you know, very mercenary uh, kind of figure. I, think, I don't know if he owns a, another team as well. And I think um, AC Milan is basically owned by an American hedge fund okay. at this point. So there's a lot. So a lot of these were, um, uh, were American owners. And one thing that a lot of the, the negative commentary latched onto was like they want to create an American style league from which you can't be relegated. And this just absolutely fascinated me because it made me realize that, yeah, that European pyramid structure of promotion and, and relegation, that's actually pretty unique, I think, to European mm. football. It might, it could, could be the same in Latin America, I don't know. But it is actually quite unique, but because it's by far the biggest sport in the world, you know, for fans of European football, this is the natural way of the world. And they actually can't imagine the kinds of competitions that basically prevail in most other sports in the rest of the world, which is, yeah, no, teams do stay in uh, regardless of how badly they do. And it was really interesting to hear this uh, this commentary from uh, people even uh, – you know, even high-level British politicians saying games will be meaningless if there's no relegation. Mm. Now, I'm a big fan of the NRL, and uh, a lot of games are very bad, but I wouldn't say that they're meaningless just because, uh, you know, just because teams can't get relegated. But okay, so coming back to this question, are Americans ruining yes. world sport? What's the result of your investigation, Dr. Day? These, uh, <laughs> these European clubs? My answer would be yes, but it's not just them. Okay. Okay, so, yeah, no, it is true mm. that American owners have often come in with really very little idea mm. about the uh, the grassroots culture and also wanting to make money out of teams. No one should ever buy a team with the aim of making money out of it. There's an old saying, the best way to make a small fortune is to start with a large fortune and buy a team. Mm. Um, you, it, it just shouldn't, I mean, yes, you, you shouldn't go bankrupt, doing it but profit maximization is not the aim of sports and this is the problem that you see with the increased financialization of everything is that all kinds of industries which traditionally just haven't made big profits or much of a profit at all are now being bought by financial interests which have a legal duty to maximize profits so for example when financial institutions buy media companies Right, most media companies don't make money or make very little money, um, and that's how they have to be run because mm. the point of media, uh, like, yes, it's got to stay afloat, but you know, nobody should ever be looking to make a huge amount of money out of media. It's an inherently low margin thing. Same. And there's with, nothing wrong with breaking even. Yeah, yeah, like, exactly. I, I hate this this obsession with profit. Yes, yeah. Isn't, yeah. yeah, no, the, you know, basically, if you're running a media company, most of the profit that you make, if you make any, should be ploughed back into mm. the product. It's the same with restaurants, mm. right? People who run restaurants do so because they want to run a restaurant. They mm. want to put food on the table for people. 
you know, it's widely accepted that it's an incredibly narrow, uh, narrow industry at all. The problem with uh, venture capital taking over things is not only do they have a completely different outlook, often they've got a completely different legal responsibility. Yeah, it's to it's to maximise uh, it's to maximise shareholder value. So now, admittedly. There are plenty of moneyed owners who've come into European football who basically do just treat it as a hobby. So the the real sort of the original opening of big money ownership was uh, Roman Abramovich at uh, Chelsea, who was a little known Russian oligarch. Um, yeah, who came in and you know obviously just had this childhood dream of uh, of owning a, mm. a soccer club, and he loses money on it. And actually, when Chelsea pulled out. Chelsea was the first to pull out of the English Super League. I think they did so with the statement that Roman Abramovich was never in this to make money when mm. it was clearly um, because the formation of the new league was clearly all about uh, money. But you've also got like um, one of the Italian club. No, I think one of the Italian clubs is basically just a financial instrument of the Qatar royal family. Sure. Um, uh, yeah, Manchester City is owned by some oil magnate mm. so um yeah there is I, I think there is this serious tension that has been brewing for a long time now and i mean every time americans get involved in english soccer there are protests about it sometimes there's some fairly nasty xenophobic aspects to uh to those protests or even anti-semitic in the case of the original protests against the glazers but um at the same time they're often is something to it in terms of this massive cultural mismatch. Now, um, at the same time, though, there are plenty of other people and plenty of other factors ruining European football. And I think there has been some fairly intelligent soul-searching on the part of English football saying, we have done this to ourselves, right? You know, they opened the door to it. They did make the game all about the negotiation of uh, television rights rather than attendance, which was the traditional kind of motor of the game. And it was almost inevitable that something like this would happen. And even if you evict the Yanks from the game, it doesn't mean that it's not going to happen again. That was an exclusive Pep investigation. Doom, 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 doom. That was actually just me reading a lot of takes from, <laughs> from the internet and synthesising them. We can all investigate in our own ways, yes. Dr. Dave. Um, talk about people who absolutely do not make a profit. 2SER wants me to read this out again. They've got a uh, mini subscription drive going. Uh, you might recall I mentioned this last week. Uh, it's going until Friday, April 30. If you'd like to support 2SER financially, please go to 2SER.com and click the subscribe button. Do it. They've got this weird theme about we wish you were here, which I do not understand, but it's still on this piece of paper, so I'll read it again. Do so they play the we Pink wish you were here. Floyd song, Wish You Were Here? I don't know, but if they do, you might be able to win it because they also tell me, I've got some fresh information here, yeah. that somehow I don't understand the process. I don't understand if there's a... There's a competition of some kind. There's maybe prices, right styles mm -hmm. of yodelers walking up a mountain or something. I have no idea, but you can win Audio Technica turntables, which means nothing to me, but also wow. records like LP records, which you'll need those turntables to play, presumably, because who has a turntable? And uh, I asked them. I I did the I did my own investigating on yeah, behalf yeah. of the the our listeners out there saying. These records, what are these records? What, do people just come in and just take what they like? They said, no, 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 we'll give you the records. Said, oh, so the records you don't like, they, they get to win. Oh. And I said, no, 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 no. Every time we get a record, we get two copies. Oh. And we'll give you some of the spares. Like, these are good records. Right. Okay. So okay. If, you, if you trust 2SER, <laughs> go, go into that competition. And maybe you can win those ter those records. You do and trust the turntables. SCR. Yeah, of course you do. Of course, I do. I trust them. Look, they could be poisonous right now, for all I know, but I trust them to not poison us when we record this podcast. Why they introduce poison gas into, into a plug, I don't know, but that's the magic of Pep. Okay. <laughs> Let's move on. Um, Supreme Court. Yeah. Um, a couple of quick things. First of all... Uh, <laughs> They're becoming less subtle, I feel, the left, when it comes to trying to get Steve Breyer to retire. Yes. I don't know if you've seen the footage of the, in the last couple of weeks yeah. 
of the Demand Justice van. Have you seen it? No, I haven't. Demand Justice, they're a lefty sort of activist group. Yeah. They uh they don't want Briar around anymore. They want a, they want a new lefty. They are driving a van around with on the side of it it says retire Briar. <laughs> Just around Good. Washington, just riding, driving Good. around. I don't know how effective that's going to be. Well, Chaz, look, yeah. <laughs> I think we've learned. They're not subtle. Over the last five years, yeah. if there's one, yeah. one overarching thing that we've learned. Yeah. Subtlety doesn't work. That is true. That is absolutely true. You are right. Uh, well, so far, Bri is hiring Clarks, but then again, Anthony Kennedy hired Clarks as well. Right. When I say hired Clarks, I mean, I mean he's a helper for the entire session to go through to next year mm. so when when people hire clerks that's not a great sign that they're about, no. about to retire but you know Anthony Kennedy did he, he did. needs to retire now yeah well the theory is I mean because for those who are wondering who are yeah. saying what why can't he just wait another year what's no, the problem no, 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 no. there are two reasons why the left are very very concerned about that the first of which is it's a 50 50 Senate yep. a 50 Senate filled with a hundred year olds yes. so it just takes one Democrat to die and it happens Yes. And then you've got some problems. Now, it's happened before. And secondly, yes. the last thing the Democrats want is to turn this into an election issue. And That's if right. and if he retires in a year's time, it will become a midterms election issue. It absolutely no, will. Yeah. yeah, now a Republican controlled Senate is not going to approve a Supreme Court judge nominated by a Democrat. You know when the last time was that a Republican-controlled Senate approved a judge nominated by a Democratic president? Oh, oh yeah. Um, uh, geez, geez, yeah. Um, well, okay. I, 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 I'll try and answer the question. Yep. I am suggesting it would have been... Uh, it would have been... It would have been in the 20s, maybe? 1895. Oh, geez. I didn't get that. I wasn't too far away. <laughs> but, um, uh, but I will say there is there is a proviso on that. Yeah. I mean, it's still a great stat, 1895. Yeah, yeah. But remember, for the best part of the last half a century, the 20th century, it was mm. the Democrat Senate. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. But, the, but still, it's still a great stat. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, if you're, in case you're wondering, uh, well, do how often does the Democratic Senate approve a Republican. Heaps. So, yeah, well, it's a lot more. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's like four times since World War II. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Uh, uh, talking about, uh, uh, this, well, we're going back to Patrice Collors now, but we're going to, get, coming up to, going back to lame excuses for a second. The, the packing the court legislation has come out. Right. Do you yes. know about this? No. Uh, uh, Nadler, this is, the, this is the chair of the Judiciary Committee here. Yeah, Na yeah. Nadler. Hey, so I spent I spent the last week basically immersed in the world of vaccine hesitancy. Oh, we're getting to that, hopefully. Okay. okay, I'll go to that next so we can talk about that. Yeah. Hank Johnson, Mondaire Jones, who's one of the new, he's like one of the new squad, mm -hmm. and Ed Markey, who is an old guy but is just really he's really chums yes. with 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 the, with the, with the so squad uh, in the Senate. They there's so three from the House, one in the Senate. They've they're pushing this Judiciary Act, which mm -hmm. will add four seats to the Supreme Court. Now, I know you're asking, why four seats? Apart from the obvious, mm. why four seats? What's their justification for that? Mm. Nadler, nine justices may have made sense in the 19th century when there were only nine circuits, but the logic behind having only nine justices is much weaker today when there are 13 circuits. Uh, <laughs> oh, look, I like it. <laughs> that's why. Of course, that's why. Look, it's that, about the circuits. That may be lame, but you come up with a better one. <laughs> to... to to mark his credit, he's yes. a little bit more straightforward. Yeah. A lot more straightforward. <laughs> what did he say? Republicans stole the court's majority. Yep. <laughs> with True. Justice Amy Coney True. Barrett's confirmation completing their crime spree. Absolutely. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> the guy's like 75 and he's using this language. Yes. This legislation will restore the court's balance and public standing and begin to repair the damage done to our judiciary and democracy. Look, that fair enough. At least he's been straight. Yeah. But I know, I know why am I bringing logic to this, but that's two justices, not four. So why not appoint two and still the Republicans have the majority on the court? I mean, that's the logic. Anyway. 
my favourite one is Mondaire Jones, who um, he's an interesting fellow. Mm. Uh, I've, I've got a bullet on him. Uh, I, don't, I don't take that the wrong way. I, like I just like I think I think he's got potential for yep. lots of laughs okay. over the next few years. Okay, um, because he, he's in, he's funny on salt as well, which I'll talk about another time because we're going to run out of time. Okay, he tweeted out simply this: Supreme Court expansion is infrastructure. <laughs> <laughs> It's true. <laughs> Legal infrastructure. <laughs> How good's that? And it doesn't appear to be joking. Chaz, everything that you've said has made me like all three of them more. <laughs> anyway, Pelosi shot that down. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> They're not going to vote on it. But um, uh, I did want to flag, though, well, just, just meant while mentioning the Supreme Court. I mean, they, obviously, they don't think it's going to pass. They want that to hang over. Yes. Hang over the Supreme Court, just the, just no, just yep. knowing, guys, if you get a bit out of the control, mm-hmm. just remember this bill's out there. Um, and talk about which there's a Supreme Court case that's about to be heard, which might be the one where people go, oh, it's uh, it's against uh, Americans for Prosperity. It's called, mm-hmm. and essentially, it's looking to rule non-electoral donation disclosure laws unconstitutional. So what I mean by that, if you think of like during an election, you donate to a candidate, that's fine. But Mm -hmm. outside an election, you might donate to a super PAC, you might Mm -hmm. donate to a cause or whatever. Um, At the moment, there's disclosure laws and depending on the state, there's disclosure laws uh, to those donations. Mm -hmm. And yeah, generally speaking, until now, the the rule has been with donations, it's all these loopholes Mm -hmm. allowing people to donate whatever they want. But in the end, you find out generally who did the donating. Yes. That's generally the the trade-off, right? Uh, there was a case in 1958, NAACP versus Alabama, um, where basically there was some Jim Crow state. I don't even remember which one it was, uh, which had disclosure laws. Alabama? Uh, that would make sense. You just said the name of the state. <laughs> no, 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 but it, 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 yeah, I, I, I know it sounds like you might, you might say, oh, of course it's Alabama. That's in the name of the, the case. Yes. I'm not 100% sure it originated there, but mm. whatever. Let's assume it is. Um, it would make sense. It would make sense because it's a Jim Crow state with the KKK was prominent. They basically were trying to get disclosure from the NAACP of all their donors. Right. And the NAACP were saying, this is not for any good reason. Mm. This is to give it to the KKK yes. so they can kill us. Yeah. So we'd like to not give them that information, mm. please. The Supreme Court said, yes, you do not need to do that. Mm. So there then became a balancing test about when it's appropriate, when it's not appropriate to have disclosure laws, right? Uh, depending on the fear and all that kind of stuff. And is there a proper purpose, yes. et cetera. Now, I'm really guessing that Alabama was the state that was involved. Probably, probably. I, I, yeah, I, I just, you know, yeah, mate, I don't like to assume things I don't know for a fact. But yes, it does make sense, yes. <laughs> I don't want to do another clarification, Dave. I've done too many recently. Okay. I live in fear of these clarifications. Um, the Anyway, in this case now, they, um, they, they're, they're expressing a concern that disclosing their, the Americans for Prosperity, which is a conservative group, mm-hmm. is concerned they're in California. They're concerned that they're disclosing their major donations to a California agency. Mm-hmm. Well, despite the fact that it's in violation of California state regulations for that information mm-hmm. to be shared, they're worried that, that they'll just pass it on to another agency anyway, and that agency might target those donors. So like, like yeah, maybe tax collectors or whatever. You know, like just might, mm. that, that's their concern. Now there's no necessary rationality behind that concern. Cause like I said, it would break California law for that to happen. Yes. But there's a lot of people on the Supreme Court at the moment who aren't big fans of disclosure of donations. Mm. So it might give them the excuse they need to start working on that. Wow. Anyway, I'm just flagging that now. That might be, that might be an interesting. Okay. Case. You heard it here first. Okay. Let's talk about, uh, while we're going running hot Republicans there, let's keep on going. I, I feel like this should be a segment every single week. I've got another yellow box of doom from the, from WinRed because they keep on changing them. <laughs> this is the end up NRCC. This is, they're getting better and better every week. They're getting better and better. This is actually a couple of weeks old mm. still. Okay. So just for those who don't remember, this is a pre-check box when you try and donate to uh, the end of RCC, a Republican group. And and this is big writing what I'm about to read. And then tiny writing, it says, well, I'll whisper to you, okay? We need to know we haven't lost you to the radical left. If you uncheck this box, we will have to tell Trump you're a defector and sided with the Dems. Check this box and we can win back the house and get Trump to run in 2024. 
make this a monthly recurring donation. So, so yeah, so tiny writing, make this a monthly recurring donation. This shit in big bold text with their pre-checked box saying, if you uncheck it, we'll have to tell Trump you're a defector. We'll have no choice but to <laughs> tell Trump you're a defector. Anyway, so that's funny. Um, a couple of things in 2024, not 2024, election news generally. Mm -hmm. Trump hack Vernon Jones. You might recall him. He used to be a Democrat. He's, uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's, he's now a Trump supporter. He's primary in Kemp in Georgia for governor. Oh, wow. Yeah, for t in 2022. Yeah, Kemp is never going to be forgiven by Republicans, no matter how much he now gets behind voter suppression. Yeah. And he, I mean, he was Mr. Voter Suppression before that I know, election. I know. It's funny, isn't it? It's ironic. Uh, now... Yeah, now Vern Jones is essentially. Oh, I, I I don't want to diminish diminish him, but he's kind of Trump's pet. Like he really Trump like like Trump loves this guy, and Vern Jones loves Anything Trump. That's elevating him. <laughs> and, 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 and so it's pretty likely Trump put him up to this. Right? It's pretty mm. likely. But the problem is Vern Jones has a few issues. Number oh, yes. one, he was a Democrat until like two years ago. Yes. Number two, he was accused of rape in two thousand and five, and his defense was no, 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 no. It was a consensual three-way sexual encounter, which is cool if you're a Democrat. But if, you're, if, you're in, if you're going for the Christian right in Georgia, might not be quite so cool. Oh, I, I suppose know, those days are past. Those days are long gone <laughs> yeah, okay. where personal morality Okay, mattered. well, try this one for, on for size. He yes. voted against a fetal heartbeat abortion ban in 2019, mm. which Kemp championed. Yes, <laughs> so, no, that, that yeah, might kill him. That, that, that one's going to stick. Anyway, so there's that. Uh, another person who's running, Lynn Wood, is running in South Carolina oh to be God. the GOP chair. He's also got some issues. One, instead of going to the South Carolina GOP convention, he went to the Oklahoma conference for some reason. And at that conference, he told he, he said things like, Donald Trump is still the president of the United States of America. He said that Bush, Clinton, Obama, and Biden were all involved in child sex trafficking. He said that the audience should study up about the Illuminati. <laughs> he questioned whether the Pope is still alive, and he claimed to have evidence <laughs> to expose child cannibalism conspiracies. I like, all of this was standard until <laughs> check that the Pope's still alive. Yeah, and uh, and this is a bit of his bit of his speech to the Health and Freedom Conference the other day okay. as well. They can't attack Q because Q is the truth. This is about the children, for God's sakes. Send this videotape. Send it to Hollywood. Hey, Clay, send it to the House of Windsor. Hey, Clay, send it to Bill Gates. Send it to the damn Illuminati. That is a spectacular... Um... So call him Mr. Chairman, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, it's... I like that his Wikipedia page says, is an American attorney and conspiracy theorist. <laughs> yes. um, that had a very kind of um, Pentecostal flavour mm. to it. Um, uh, I'm just trying to see if there's any Pentecostal background there. But, I mean, it, it is, even for non-Pentecostals and non-charismatic Christians, there's been a real adoption of that kind of uh Pentecostal style where yeah the entire experience is one the, the whole idea is the speech is supposed to whip people into a state of physical ecstasy look he whipped me into a state I'm not sure it was physical ecstasy <laughs> <laughs> and so the more even even as important as of the content of the speech is the the sort of rhetorical style like I could not help but admire what he was doing to the audience mm. uh in in that speech uh i mean it's it's horrifying yeah. it's absolutely horrific but i mean this also <laughs> shows you like you're not going to be able to reason <laughs> with that probably not with that and it's you know i think so much of politics is this kind of emotional content and to mm. some extent it always has been but we're just at this at this particular point in time where the political economy of the media has sort of coincided with this politics of heightened emotionalism where the way that you keep people engaged, the way that you keep them glued to the screen is by just this constant kind of um, emotional stimulation. 
And, you know, this is not new in the in the US. I think of people like Billy Sunday, mm. um, who was the great uh, evangelist of the early 20th century, who he would, you know, he would go on these tours where he would speak to audiences of three million people. And um, uh, with this Christian message, although my favourite ever Billy Sunday quote was in 1917 when the US had just entered World War I, he said, if you were to turn hell upside down, you would find the words made in Germany stamped on the bottom. It's a pretty hardcore thing to say. Yeah. That like basically <laughs> Germany made the, the yeah. Satan. Send uh, that send that tape to Bill Gates. Yeah, but <laughs> I, so, sorry, the point I'm making here is that it, it's never just about the content. Yeah. It, it's about the effect, the, the very visceral effect. It's a, it's a form of entertainment. It, it's a form of emotional stimulation. Check. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Anyway. Anyway, that's Linwood for you. Yes. Um, let's not forget this is a guy who, who quite seriously tweeted back in January that yeah. Mike Pence was about to be executed. <laughs> He's not necessarily the most reliable yes. witness. And, anyway. He was one of Trump's yeah. last lawyers standing. Yeah. Right? Well, no, I don't think he was ever actually Trump's lawyer. He was one of those people working on Trump's behalf. Yes. Without being employed. Yeah, when by all Trump. the real lawyers. Yeah, it was basically <laughs> him, Powell, and Giuliani, right? Uh, pretty much. Yeah. yeah. Uh, finally, on the, in this area, mm -hmm. um, Mike Lindell, he's, he's never far away from this area. Yes. He launched his uh, social media site oh, this week. It's what called, is it? It's called Frank, and it's a free speech zone, except. You don't get to use the C word, the N word, the F word, or God's name in vain. Oh. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's some pretty funny video of him when he launched it, um, taking calls live on Nagel. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And all these prankers calling out, pretending to be Trump and stuff, and him getting more and more flustered, going, <laughs> Look what they're doing! They're trying to stop me because they know I'm getting too close. It was very good. Anyway, in this area, do you want to just. Tell us quickly about the rise and fall of the America First Caucus. Oh, yes. Like this the, lasted as long as the English like Super League. About two days. Yeah, like yeah. That. So it was announced uh, by Marjorie Taylor Greene, mm. Paul Gosar, yeah. and um, uh, Louis Gomez. That's all right. And Matt Gates also announced that he was going they to They are three very them. special so people. Really, really high quality. Actually, I don't, did they even announce it? Or I, I, Well, what they did, yes. her, her, Marjorie Taylor Greene's spokesperson. Yes. Said that Nick Dyer, Nick Dyer, yeah, said yeah. that said that he told CNN yes. in a statement, an official statement, yes, be on the lookout for the release of the America First Caucus platform when it's announced to the public very soon, yes, and then the next day someone got their hand on the platform, yes, and then the day after, Nick Dyer said. Green is not launching anything, and the document that was released was an early planning proposal, and nothing was agreed to or approved. Right. <laughs> so, okay. So that's the beginning and end. Yes. Tell us the middle. So, what was this going to be? Well, <laughs> yes. according, according to the documents, mm -hmm. uh, the big foundation of this America First Caucus was that American political culture is uniquely related to Anglo Saxon mm. culture. Yeah. And <laughs> that. If you, I think that there's some word about if you import millions of foreigners who don't, uh, you know, uh, who, who don't agree with those values, then then we're going to lose our country. Now, mm. this is talking about Anglo-Saxon culture. Man, that's some fucking retro racism because mm. that's that's like whiteness as exclusive of Irish. Yeah, racism. Yeah, yeah I'm not sure any of the people who are involved yeah. would qualify. As yeah. Anglo-Saxon. Yeah, so if you look, so when the, the the height of the use of the term Anglo-Saxon mm. in the US was during the 20s, which in many ways was kind of the most racist decade. Um, so, but this was when we had the second resurrection of the Ku Klux Klan, who were reborn not just as a Southern organization, but actually largely as a Midwestern organization that they had the traditional fixation <coughs> on white supremacy, but they were also really against Catholics, Jews, bootleggers, mm. uh, all these things that they saw as a front to Anglo-Saxon America. So that, and that, you know, this is at the time when Southern and Eastern Europeans were seen as beyond the pale. Uh, so mm. the United States had sort of like the equivalent of the white Australia policy, 
they had these zones of exclusion, uh, which basically precluded any immigrants from anywhere other than northwestern Europe. Although, in. what's strange about this? I feel like they didn't understand that because no. in the same document they call for a return to an architectural style that quote befits the progeny of European architecture. And I would mm. have thought European architecture largely would be associated with yeah, Greeks and Romans. Yeah, well, and exactly. They're talking people sp- who aren't Anglo-Saxons. They're talking specifically <laughs> about neoclassical <laughs> architecture there. And we know this because one of Trump's last and weirdest moves was an executive order saying that all new federal buildings had to be... Well, originally it was all new federal buildings have to be built in neoclassical style. Now, I think someone might have had a word with someone and said, that's a little bit Nazi, a little bit fascist, <laughs> because there, you know, there, there was a major insistence uh, in Nazism that everything had to be built in neoclassical style because they saw Nazi Germany as the heirs to the Roman and Greek empires. So I think it was then modified <laughs> to, to include some other styles, uh, more American styles like mm. Art Deco. Sure. Uh, for for example, which is not an exclusively American style, but one very much associated very with tolerant. American <laughs> modernism. They were really, really against brutalism. Okay, they hate brutalism. If they see, they see U.S. Tower, they see U- U.T.S. Tower, which is just uh, well, if that blind was open, would be able to see U.T.S. Tower. Yeah, they'd be spewing. They they would be absolutely spewing. Uh, <laughs> Sure. Sorry. One of my hobbies is taking photographs of brutalist architecture. Mm. It's actually my only hobby. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, are, you a, are you a terrorist, Dave? But, <laughs> and it, oh. made, uh, it, it made me so happy to see how upset they get by brutalist architecture. But mm. anyway, that's a that's a conversation for another time. Um, yeah, but this Anglo-Saxon thing, it really is just this, yeah, Anglo-Saxon married <laughs> married with this really sort of dis, uh, very, very narrow architectural tastes. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a real throwback. I think it's been a long time since they've people have explicitly invoked Anglo-Saxon because ever since Nixon... Uh, Democrats defected to Republicans, it's been understood that a really, really important part of that conservative Republican coalition, especially conservative on race issues, is so-called white ethnics, especially from major urban centres or the suburbs of major urban centres in the the north and midwest of the United States. So Greeks, Italians, Poles, uh, and the Irish especially. Um, so this is a very, very weird, uh, weird kind of throwback. If, by mm. the way, if you're in, interested in this sort of um, fascination with Anglo-Saxon culture, so in the 1920s, the major theorist of this was Lothrop Stoddard, uh, and his book is he going on the book no, list? he is not going on the book list. <laughs> His book, The Rising Tide of Colour, um, was uh, was the sort of Bible of this, but but very much lampooned in The Great Gatsby by yeah. the character of Tom Buchanan, oh. who says, oh, have you heard of this book by this man, Goddard? So he's such a moron, he doesn't even know the name of the, yeah, of the guy and talks about you know, the, the white race is going to be overwhelmed. Um, yeah, so anyway, this lasted... About two days. Yeah, about two days. About as long as it took for Matt Gates to say he was going to <laughs> yeah. join it. Um, it was correctly identified as basically advocating great replacement theory. Yep. Which, which Tucker Carlson had just Tuck, been talking Tuck about. Tucker Carlson had just been <laughs> talking yeah. about it, saying the Democrats mm. had this scheme to introduce mm. more obedient voters mm. uh, into the United yeah. States. To replace the current voters. To replace. With more obedient foreign voters. Hey. Yeah. You know, if they really wanted to replace Americans with more obedient foreign voters, you know who they would import? Who's that? Australians. Yeah. Two years ago in the Australia Talks survey, (laughs) there were all these questions about what makes a good Australian. Yeah. So like 87% of people, the most, the the single, I mean, you could choose a lot of responses, but the single one that the most people chose was obeying the laws of the country. Really? 87%. Well, let's get straight into COVID because you brought it up now. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm sick of Mar- Mar- Marjorie Taylor Greene. Uh, just, okay, so briefly, um, the the numbers, they've, they've hit their 200 million dose mark under under Biden now. 
Um, they're up to 51% of adults who have had at least a single dose. 33% are fully vaccinated. 80, over 80% of 65 pluses have had a single dose. Six, over 65% are fully vaccinated. Um, 45% of the new cases in America, the British variant. They're all the, the, the basic stats. Interestingly, in the world, there's mm. a lot of talk about India at the moment because it's going absolutely nuts yes. in India. Yes, Those stats, like I think everyone is across the fact those stats probably aren't aren't legit, the mm. Indian stats. They're yeah. probably a lot greater because, yeah, there's a lot of rural areas mm. that don't count anything. But I'm not sure people are across just how how off they might be. Right. Now, the IHME, they really scored some, they really laid some eggs in their predictions yeah. <laughs> about, uh, about America and England and so forth. So, mm. yeah, take us with a grain of salt, I guess. Yeah. But their, their estimate of how many new cases there are in India when India says... 300,000 new cases Yes, is 7 million new cases a day. So like they might not be dead on the money, but it gives you an indication of just, I mean, there's almost certainly a few million cases Mm. a day in India at the moment. Uh, And we know for a fact that some states in India Mm. have a ratio of nine to one in their deaths between the official deaths and the real deaths. Mm. So given there's 2,000 deaths a day, let's not, Multiply by nine, it might just be you know, 10,000 deaths a day. It's still a lot of deaths. I know India's got a lot of people. Yeah. But yeah, they're in a bit of strife. I saw Delhi's positivity rate was 30%. Yeah. 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 Which is yeah. insane. Uh, and in terms of vac- vaccines, like we haven't even talked about Africa, where 1% of people have been vaccinated mm. uh, compared to like, you know, they 6% of North Americans, 22% of Europeans, et cetera. Um, some interesting stuff on vaccines, though. Um, I tell, oh, I tell you what I love. Mm. Have you seen... Alaska is offering free, a free vaccine to tourists, which is such a great idea. That is a fantastic idea. Because, yeah, because there's a way of boosting, boosting their economy. It's safe for them because yeah. they're offering a free vaccine. Yes. And at the same time, you know, it's helping the American general. It's such a great idea. What's an even better idea is Krispy Kreme is offering a free donut every day for the rest of the year for anyone who gets a, gets a vaccine. That's fantastic. Oh, my God. I would. You know how much I love donuts. Yes. I, I would get I get every vaccine. I get the shitty Chinese vaccine. I'd get the experimental Cuban vaccines. I want to get 10 vaccines. So I can just get made donuts. Oh, my God. So good. I probably doesn't work like that. But I don't care. <laughs> I'd do it anyway. Just on the off chance. Krispy Kreme. <laughs> um, okay. Interesting stat. In terms of vaccines, uh, like there's a lot of theory about vaccines, but now we can actually see in practice the actual yep. results, right? Mm-hmm. They've got what they call breakthrough cases, which are when you have a vaccine, mm-hmm. you get it again, yes. right? There have been, well, there's been over 200, 210 million or, two or so d- doses so far in America. Mm-hmm. There have been fewer than 6,000 breakthrough cases, people who had the vaccine who... who um, uh, got COVID again. So that's 0.007%. Right. That's a pretty good number. That is right? a pretty good number. Of the breakthrough cases identified by the CDC, more than 40% occurred in people older than 60. So that's an issue. Mm-hmm. Uh, and 65% were female, interestingly. 7% of the patients experiencing a breakthrough infection were hospitalized. So seven, only 7% of the 6,000 wow. were hospitalized. So that's not many. And so far, 74 people have died after experiencing breakthrough infection. So in other words, less than one in a million Jesus. Have, have died after getting the vaccine. So that's great numbers. And mm-hmm. there's some great real life examples as well. An unvaccinated healthcare worker set off a COVID-19 outbreak in Kentucky the other day in a nursing home. All right. 75 out of, the eight, of, out of 83 Residents were vaccinated. Mm -hmm. Eight out of eight of the unvaccinated ones got COVID. Wow. 18 of the 75 who were vaccinated got COVID. One of the vaccinated people died out of the 75. Yep. Two out of the eight unvaccinated died. So that's yeah, that, that's pretty good numbers. Because remember, what I just told you the nursing, Those the old people, numbers, yes. the old people, the ones who who the vaccines work least well for. Yes. Right? Uh, and Rockefeller University looked at 417 employees of the school who'd been fully vaccinated to see how many had been infected. There were two, right. half a percent. Okay. Interestingly, I talked about Chile last week and the Chinese vaccines being dodgy. Mm-hmm. They might, it may just be one dose that's dodgy, not two doses. Ah. Because Chile has just done a, a big test because they're worried about this mm-hmm. for good reasons. Yes. <laughs> the first dose 
was 3% effective Mm -hmm. of the Chinese vaccine in one test and 16% in another test. Mm -hmm. Two doses were 56% effective in one test or 67% effective in the other test. So that's Mm. that's not as good as Pfizer and Moderna, but it's not bad. It's not bad. So maybe the Chinese vaccine just just need extra doses, maybe two, maybe Mm -hmm. three. They they have talked about a third dose with the Chinese vaccine. Um, Interestingly, we talk about vaccine hesitancy. Uh, Something we'll talk about with the J&J pause about how it affect people, but we've got some numbers now. Yeah. uh, YouGov polled people on either side of the pause and J&J went from 52-36 confidence yep. in J&J to 37-39. So that, that's not a surprise. Mm. But Pfizer and Moderna numbers didn't change. Mm. And that's important. That is, that is very important. Yeah, because we're worried that it would spread it across. And then interestingly, even given that, Frank Luntz did a focus group with people who are vaccine hesitant. Yes. And they weren't bothered by the J&J pause at all. No. Now, this is really interesting. Mm. And, you know, for those of us in this research community, this was something that freaked us out Mm. because of the fact that overwhelmingly when you ask people about why are they hesitant towards vaccines, Mm. it's to do with the fact that they were developed, they feel that they were developed too quickly, Mm. developed under political pressure. So you would think, you know, that seeing one (laughs) fail this Mm. dramatically Mm. could really uh, confirm people's suspicions. Mm. But I think that what is going on is that, yes, people have seen the failure of a vaccine, but they've also seen a lot of successes mm. of uh, vaccines. So I'm chalking this one up to basic, that you know, the basic fact that people are seeing both successes and failures and they're actually seeing successes outweigh the failures. Interestingly, in Australia, Roy, Mo- Roy Morgan did some research last week that found even after the AstraZeneca problem, uh, the numbers of Australians who... Uh, said that they were willing to take the vaccine didn't really change yeah. at all. So yeah. this might well, not just be an American thing. And, yeah. I mean, that you know, Australia, we only got one vaccine. Yeah. It's not like the US where, yeah. it, you know, they had a lot of different... So, yeah, this this is a very hopeful finding that yeah. we're seeing in this space. Interestingly, by the way, in that same focus group of Frank Luntz's where they weren't really that bothered by the J&J pause, yeah. the thing they were most bothered by was Pfizer saying that you might need to get booster shots in 12 months' time. Oh, yes. They were going, oh, here we go. It's going to go on and on and on forever. You're going to keep on getting, having to get, that. that's what that's what they were saying. The vaccine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw that there was mm. one mm. Uh, respondent who was like, where does it end? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Where does it end? <laughs> well, wherever it's it like ends. having it's... to get a shot every year as yeah. opposed to having to wear a mask Everywhere. And also, wherever it ends is quicker if you take that bloody vaccine. Yes. <laughs> like, if you want to end, everyone take the vaccine. Oh, uh, and the EU has declared the J&J vaccine safe and effective, by the way. they I don't trust the single yeah. word, the EU. <laughs> sure. Um, there's a couple of just random things uh, here. Uh, for 18 to 64s, yes. in counties where Biden won by more than 20 points, yep. they are vaccinating 12 points more than average. Ah. In counties where Trump won by more than 20 points, they are vaccinating 19 points less than average. Mm-hmm. And there is a straight line between the two for all the in-between. Nice. So, yeah. Ordinary least squares regression line there. There you go. And uh, as part of the same data, just one blue state, Georgia, and that hardly counts as a blue, <laughs> blue state, state. <laughs> is below 30% in terms of the number who have had their first dose. Wow. And one red state, South Dakota is north of 40%. Wow. So there you go. So they're, they're quite clumped. Um, uh, the other thing is to, to watch out for. I don't have the numbers for this. This is more anecdotal than anything. Mm-hmm. But there's a few articles being written about this. New York Times has written a few. Yep. We may be getting close to the wall. Like there's a few in Michigan, for instance, which is the worst place in yes. America for COVID at the moment. Mm-hmm. There are, especially in rural Michigan, there yep. are a number of clinics that just don't have any appointments. Yeah. Like that just no one wants the vaccine, even though they really need the vaccine yeah, in Michigan. Yeah, that's deeply uh, worrying. Yeah, and Pennsylvania apparently is a few areas as well, which are just, yep. there's just no demand. Mm-hmm. And like in America as a whole, like I said before, is about what, 51, 52% of adults, but the, which is like about 35%, 34, 35% of people. Mm-hmm. 
uh, that's not enough. No. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so that hopefully that's that's just a, a lull. If you look at the vaccine numbers at the moment, they've gone down, but that's because of the J&J &J pause. Mm -hmm. And so they've gone down to about 3 million a day. They were almost 3.5 million a day last week. Yep. But, yeah, but the worry is that we might start seeing demand issues rather than supply sure. issues. yes. And one more thing I want to add about uh, this is, Naomi, I just read just a random article about this. Naomi Wolf has become a nut. Did you know this? Oh, well, like there was always a bit of that there. I know, now. but man, I'm going to read some tweets to you. Okay. Like, these yeah. are, like this is pretty incredible. I'm going to start with the least weird and right. I'm going to get to the most weird. Okay, okay? Yes. yeah. Four tweets. One, this is her talking about, um, this is all about COVID, right? Yeah. Children now don't have the human reflex reflex that they that they when you smile at them they smile back. I'm seeing kids with their lower faces hanging inertly, absolutely unmoving facial muscles <laughs> when they take their masks off. Dark circles under their eyes from low oxygen. Okay, so that's that's one. Mm -hmm. That's the least crazy one. Hundreds of women on this page say she's pointing to a page say they are having bleeding slash clotting after vaccination. Or that they bleed oddly being around vaccinated women. <laughs> being around vaccinated women. Wow. Unconfirmed, needs more investigation, but lots of reports. Next one. You know, I read the Moderna website and the sources in my video about how the mRNA is not actually a vaccine but a software platform. I actually work with developers who create software, so I understand how, how dangerous it is to have a tech in one's body that can receive uploads. You know what? That would be dangerous, I expect, <laughs> to, to, to actually have a computer chip injected into you. I mean, this is Naomi Wolf who, uh, like, I read the Moderna website. Yeah. She wrote an entire book which turned out to be premised on a complete misreading. Yeah, it got pulped. Of English legal records. It got pulped after the first interview that yes. was conducted with the BBC. And that was like supposedly something that she <laughs> knew about. Yes. Where, okay, so the, the thesis of this book was that a lot of homosexuals had been yes. executed yes. in Victorian England. That was based on her misreading of yes. the, uh, the legal records. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, life was very, very hard for mm. gay people in Victoria and England, but they weren't actually being executed. Yeah, yeah. essentially, I mean, we, we, we just want to explain this quickly because it is funny. Essen yeah. Essentially, there was there was a line in the sentencing book, this big, the big book of sentences that she looked at, where it would say something like, for death or something like that. Yeah. And, and she assumed that meant death penalty. And yes. so she wrote this whole book around, book around the 19th century death penalty of gay people. Yes. And it turned out that it actually meant not the death penalty. Yes. And anyone who understood the the law from the 19th century could have told her that. In fact, the interviewer she spoke to from the BBC understood. knew that yes. and pointed it out to her. And she was like, oh, and that was the end of her book. And she never bothered to research past reading the big, ye big book of sentences. Anyway, I told you there were four and I told you they got crazier. Oh my God. How Wait many for did this. We get through? This is in response to a piece about the lockdown potentially lasting for years. Yeah. Okay. Terrifying. Also confirms slash explains the conversation I overheard in a restaurant in Manhattan two years ago in which an Apple employee was boasting about attending a top secret demo. They had a new tech to deliver vaccines with nanoparticles that let you travel back in time. Not kidding. <laughs> On that note. <laughs> yes. Okay. It's a great note. Yes. Actually, the last thing that I want to say <laughs> is uh, Walter Mondale died this week. Um, it's always very sad when such a promising politician dies so young. <laughs> if you want to, if you're interested in Walter, Mon Walter Mondale and you don't want to hear smart assery about him, <laughs> you should watch the Planet America on on. I in, in all seriousness, he was a good guy, and a, a, I, I I would actually say he was a highly competent politician despite losing 49 states to Ronald Reagan in 1984. The yeah, I, 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 one of the things I mentioned on the show was yeah. he was certainly more competent than Jimmy Carter. And had he gone for president yes. in 1976, very America true. might have been a very different place. Very true. Okay, but please you, don't yeah. tell John that I was being <laughs> sarcastic, but, but you he, know. He already knows. Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin, Jim Morrison, Kurt Cobain, Walter. <laughs> Great reunion. See you next week. See you. Bye-bye.